is beautiful. Hello. Thanks for coming out. It's nice to see everybody here, especially under the circumstances. This is not, it's not going to work for me. I'm not, um, as you know, if you've seen me talk, I, I have to, I have to read. I, I can't, just can't, I, I can't commit it to memory. And also I have had probably three and a half hours of sleep. Not that I stress about public speaking at all. So, so you're in for a ride. I hope it's coherent. Um, so the other day, a friend of mine asked me a funny question. Um, she asked me if I listened to the news. And it was kind of funny because it was very direct and disarming. And I'm kind of like, well, yeah, duh. Of course I listened to the news. But I also had a little bit of guilt because, you know, the truth is not so much, you know. I don't listen to the to the news nearly as much as I used to. Probably, I would say, just enough to be able to answer who the current president is. So I'm not found mentally incompetent. And um, I'm not totally burying my head in the sand. And I can still finish my crossword puzzles. So that's kind of my, I dole out the news to be able to kind of hit those, check those boxes. Um, but it turned out that, like me, she finds the news hard to stomach. And uh, the world outside of East Sacramento can be a pretty scary, cha chaotic place. But as we know, bad things are happening all over. And the news to me is like a shrill siren. It's sort of a never-ending punch list of um, problems that are both urgent and like a tire fire, impossible to put out. I'm not sure how to solve them. Not unlike our own lives. And so many of us come here, we seek refuge here. We meet in meditation groups and in recovery circles. We attend practices and we find comfort and strength in sharing both our silence and our stories together. And it seems like no sooner do we find some little bit of calm, a little refuge, a safe shelter, then somebody or something is at the door to remind us that no place is completely safe. And that is what has happened here. I was reminded of this again with the threats that were made on our community here and specifically against our teacher's life by an individual with severe mental illness and a history of criminal violence an individual who was incarcerated for assault and attempted murder. And in our little corner of the world, we've been turned upside down, right? We have security now. We have new locks. We have new protocols. We've canceled talks and classes. There's limited access. There's disruption everywhere. And in a way, sometimes it feels like the bad guys win when that shit happens, you know? But we have to be smart, and we have to take care. But even more than that, it's the residual stuff that sticks, right? It's the fear, the dread, the anxiety, the what if something happens. So I've been acutely aware of just how vulnerable each and every one of us is. And I felt frustrated and helpless in the face of an enforcement system that doesn't intervene until something physically harmful has happened. It's outrageous. And I know you share a lot of those feelings with me. So for some of us who maybe have experienced trauma, the threat opens old wounds and some friends aren't here with us today as a result of that. And, um, in talking about these things lately, Rinpoche suggested that I give a talk on protector practice. And I, I'm no expert. I don't know, I don't know a lot, uh, but I'm happy to share what I've gleaned from reading and in talking with my teacher. And as we say, all the mistakes are my own, as if we didn't know that already, but, uh, but we, just for the record. why we need protection. So as I was starting to think about this topic, why do we need protecting and from what and from whom? 
exactly. A line from a poem kept rattling in my head. It was it was kind of weird. Like I just kept hearing it like a like a familiar echo. So it took a it took a little bit. I had to think about it, but then I found it and it seemed to sum it up nicely. And it's this old poem by Robert Frost called Desert Places. So I wanted to share it with you to kind of kick off our talk. And it may seem completely um, disconnected. And you know what? It might be, but I think I'm going to try to make it a, a connection here. Snow falling and night falling fast. Oh, fast in a field I looked into going past, and the ground almost covered smooth in snow, but a few weeds and stubble showing fast, showing last. The woods around it have it. It's theirs. All animals are smothered in their lairs. I am too absent-spirited to count this loneliness includes me unawares. And lonely as it is, that loneliness will be more lonely ere it will be less, a blanker whiteness of benighted snow with no expression, nothing to express. They cannot scare me with their empty spaces between stars, on stars where no human race is. I have it in me so much nearer home to scare myself with my own desert places. So this poem stood out to me for a few reasons. For one, when we talk about Vajrayana practice, it's often spoken of in poetic language, describing and hinting and alluding at the nature of reality, using symbolic rather than concrete terms. And there's a kind of cutting through that slips past our defenses when we use poetry. So we have this narrator who's making a crossing and as with all crossings, we know that, you know, it's a transition. There's going to be some insight, some sort of transformation. It's winter. It's cold. There's a blanketing snow. That's impending death, something threatening outside. Things have gone to ground. But instead of, seeking, instead of the things that have gone underground being safe, they're smothered in their lairs. It doesn't sound like a cozy den at all, but some entombment is happening, some you know, they're trapped in there, throwing doubt about the idea of safety and that hiding from what's happening outside could possibly protect them. And here's a pivot, the realization that the barrenness of it all, the emptiness, is not simply outside, external to our speaker. His spirit and frame of mind are also one with the scene. Mind and reality are one and the same. He realizes that the things going on outside are no more frightening than what's happening nearer to home within himself. So he observes he's scaring himself with his own desert places. Who knew how Vajrayana Frost was? <laughs> and this poem, as well as others of his, question what lies within and what lies without. In Buddhist terms, Lama Jimpa Rinpoche says that the enemy we need protecting from resides within and takes the form of our delusional mind, our misperceived self. Now, I don't think anyone's suggesting that there's nothing happening outside or that we shouldn't have our feelings or that we should somehow make fear disappear. Fear can be a useful thing. It keeps us from harm. It keeps us vigilant on our toes, but it can also be enormously triggering and overwhelming and distracting. And more often than not, it sends us into hiding and engaging in avo avoidant behaviors. The Buddhist scholar, uh, Dr. Alexander Berzin says that in general, we can't easily or very naturally undertake internal practices to overcome our fears on our own. Most of us need to have some external protection to provide a situation in which to feel a bit safer, like having a member in black outside the door guarding our temple. Person says that once we feel safer, then it's easier to access our own inner ability, inner ability to overcome fear. So protective practice isn't going to solve our problems, but instead it can provide the circumstances that make it easier for us to solve our problems on our own. So how do these circumstances make it easier to solve problems? Well, as Johnny Rotten might say, fear, like anger, is an energy. We need to learn how to harness and transform this negativity. In Tantra, we work with our powerful emotions like fear to quickly achieve enlightenment to benefit everyone. 
Dr. Burson says that this transformation is on the basis of three principal pathways of the mind. The first being renunciation or surrender. We have to give up our old neurotic ways, including our negative self-image and other self-destructive states of mind and behavior. And this giving up is hard to do. It's really hard and it's scary. As anyone who has had to give up an addiction knows, it means you have to stop running from your problems or hiding from your fears and self-doubts. There's no numbing out. We're willing to be exposed and naked and stupid and socially awkward and heartbroken and let down and foolish and scared and small. And I could keep going on all the things that we spend lifetimes trying to protect ourselves from. We don't stop having the feelings, but we do have to stop trying to stop the feelings in destructive ways and learn to work with them. And that's a difference. And we have to have the strength to face, in order to have the strength to face this, we need protection. The second pathway is through bodhicitta, the mind wishing to become enlightened for the benefit of others, not just ourselves. So we're taking on or working with other people's problems. And really, by other people, we're talking about literally every single person. And that's a little scary, too. Um, you can't just say, yeah, I'll work with you and you, but not you. There's no, we don't get that choice. And in recovery, we do this a lot too, simply by showing up and listening. We're saying we're here for you and your problems are workable. We care. My crazy is the same of you. It might be a different color, <laughs> but it's the same. Here, give, give part of it to me. I'll help you put it down. But working with other people's problems doesn't mean enabling them or allowing them to act out on us. The protectors are actually a great boundary enforcer. They can be pacifying or subjugating, but we'll get to that in a minute. The takeaway here is that um, benefiting others doesn't mean letting others do whatever they want. And so, for example, Burton Day doesn't get to come through these doors. It's a hard stop. We have to have the wisdom mind to see that love and caring can be fierce, to see the helplessness, the helpfulness in that, and for, for us and for, for him, for his well-being as well. So committing to work with others, no matter what, is hard and scary, and we need help. And then the third pathway is emptiness. A person says that with the understanding of emptiness or interdependence or no self, we're giving up our usual confused projections about the world. And this is scary too, he says. And this makes me laugh because it's really the Mac Daddy of scary. And it's the most understated. Realizing that nothing is as it appears, nothing is. is like free falling through space with no parachute. So it seems obvious we're going to need some backup on that one. So the Dharma protectors. Um, a little word of caution from Rinpoche. He says, protector practice is part of guru yoga. And without the correct view, it can be dangerous and create more problems than it solves. So we need approval and instruction from our teacher. Otherwise, we risk engaging in worldly instead of enlightened activity. So we talked a little about where the fear comes from and why we need protection. And so now I want to look at the protectors themselves. Dharmapala literally means Dharma protector or one who guards the Buddhist teachings. Fear and threat stir up difficult, dark forces inside of us. And to be effective, the protector has to be bigger and badder than the things that we're afraid of. And so that's part of why they take on this nightmarish appearance. It often comes in the form of a giant, terrifying, fiery-haired, fanged badass whose very sight makes people run screaming. As awesome as this protector is, like Paul Den Lamo, whose picture you have in your hands and who's behind me here, they work for us, and we're the ones who are in control. And while we might be in control, it's still a relationship. And it's kept harmonious through giving of gifts. So when we do protect a practice, we might offer tea or put out some 
treats, things like that. We offer food and drink and we create this relationship. This, It's a close bond, it says. I'm going to do this for you. You'll take care of me. Um, it's also sort of like a relationship you might have with a mastiff. You know, you want to be nice to the dog. Make sure it's well fed. <laughs> Has a nice warm place to sit. And, um, and treat it well. You don't want it turning against you. And our fears will turn against us, as we know. So now I'd like you to meet Paul and Lamo. Earlier, I handed out a picture of her, um, and it's so dense with meaning that literally we could do an entire talk about just unpacking the sort of fever dream of the iconography. Um, the visual aids are helpful uh, when we meditate. We use them to vividly call to mind the deity, um, and there's a lot going on here, and it's got a lot of shock value to really drive home her role, and that so we are more able to see concretely what we're talking about. Paulden Lama's name means glorious goddess. Uh, she's also Sri Devi, so it's like a little translation, glorious goddess. She's also called the queen of the armed warriors. She's a manifestation of the enlightened feminine, a transcendent protector. She's a fully, she's fully enlightened. And she's also the protector of Tibet and the Dalai Lamas. She appears in dark form of kind of a blue-black, a wrathful emanation of Tara, and is a fierce aspect of wisdom and love, the unstoppable fury of a mother protector that cuts through delusion and chaos and obstacles. And yet she protects, even as she reminds us not to be attached, even to our own children. There's a horrible backstory, which I'll share with you. Protectors sometimes have what's called a backup story, a, a backstory or conversion narrative that tells how they were born and typically the violent circumstances that lead them to becoming guardians. And Paulden Lama's story goes like this. She was married to an evil king who killed Dharma practitioners. When she married, she vowed to make him fair, favorable toward Buddhism or she put an end to the whole dynasty. For many years, she tried to change the king's evil ways of murdering his subjects, but to no avail. To make things even worse, their son was being raised to kill Buddhists. After exhausting all the ways to change her husband's ways, she gave him an ultimatum. And like in most relationships, it didn't work. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> I, I just, it's funny. My daughter gave her boyfriend an ultimatum. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> it blended tears. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, so one day while the king was away, she killed her son. It gets better. She drank his blood with the skull cup with his, out of his own skull and ate his flesh. She then rode away on a horse with her son's flayed, made in a saddle with her son's flayed skin. As she was riding away, her husband had come back from hunting and realized what had happened, and enraged, he shot a poisonous arrow at her, and it missed her, but it struck her horse or mule that she was riding on in the rump. The queen removed the poison arrow and said, may the wound of my mount become an eye large enough to watch over the 24 regions, and may I myself be the one to extirpate the lineage of the malignant kings of Lanka. Thus, Paul and Lama's mount has a third eye on its rump. There are a lot of little variations to the story. You know, sometimes she was married, some, uh, the kind of a hell being, and, and, and others, she was a very beautiful woman who chose to remain in this state, you know, because of the, of the suffering that she endured because of it. But, um, some also, the end of the story goes that when she died, she went to hell. And then, because she is a bad mother, literally, she fought her way out of it and um, escaped to the charnel grounds. And she wandered the char charnel grounds um, in despair and not, you know, you know, not understanding why she was still alive. And, and so she, she ended up you know, praying to Buddha Vajradhara uh, 
trying trying to find some peace, you know, a reason to live. And he appeared to her and asked her to stay to protect the Dharma. And she was astonished by that and she accepted. And so she use, uses her weapons, her power for good. So let's unpack a little bit of what we're looking at in this picture. And this one I think is, is even easier to see. Um, she appears blue-black. It's this is color that is associated with wrathfulness. Her body glistens with, with human blood and fat and ash. She's holding a, a, vajra, a club topped with a vajra, which is a weapon that was used to watch over the oath-bound, ensuring um, dedication and integrity to upholding the Buddha Dharma. Her left hand, um, raised to the level of her heart or her chest, carries a blood-filled skull from a child born out of incestuous union. Her third eye is the eye of wisdom, and it's wide open. She sits on a mule, and here we can see the mule's eye, a wound that has been transformed into insight, watching over the past, present, and future. The reins and the bridle are made of serpents. She rides in on a black tornado across a sea of human blood and bodies. In her mouth, she holds the demon of mental afflictions, and she bites down on it with her fangs. Her hair is on fire, the fire of perfect wisdom that incinerates worldly conceptions that cause all of our suffering. And she's wearing a crown of five skulls. And these skulls represent the five poisons of greed, anger, ignorance, jealousy, and pride. And they also are sort of the flip side of the five Buddha families, in that if we remain deluded, then what could be transformed into wisdom remains a poison. She has a necklace of 50 severed human heads representing the 50 worldly states of mind that must be cut off. And we know that her saddle is made of the flayed um, skin of her son. There's more, but I think that probably is enough for now. <laughs> but wait. Um, so um, Miranda Shah, who is a scholar of Vajrayana Buddhism, reminds us that Paul Van Lamo is entirely free of malice and selfish interest. She manifests, as a she manifests as menacing not to frighten the faithful, but to confound and terrify demonic beings and evildoers who are driven by hatred, anger, and greed to inflict harm on others and increase suffering in the world. She chases them down on her horse with an arsenal of weaponry and magic to subdue and transform them, removing the danger uh, that they pose to us. She writes, wrathful deities demonstrate that there is pure energy even in the heart of aggression. The meditator must cease seeing fearsome and hostile appearances as threats to the ego and realize that they're just they're patterns of pure energy devoid of negativity. Ken McLeod, a teacher, author, and translator of Tibetan Buddhism, says that the protectors reflect forces stirred up in us when we encounter difficult situations. From the Vajrayana perspective, there's wakefulness even in these dark forces. Through protector practice, we get familiar with these, how they work, and come to recognize the, wakeful, the wakefulness present in them. So by doing this practice, we commit to be awake, whatever life throws our way, using four kinds of awakened awakening action, or these awakening actions are approaches to challenges. And this is kind of echoing what I was saying earlier about we don't, there's this idea sometimes that we have to be passive as Buddhists, that we we don't have hard stops and we don't get angry. Um, that's just not true. And and not not even, doesn't even make sense. The four approaches. Well, one approach is to be calming or pacifying. Right? We give things a chance to sort themselves out without us necessarily interfering when a situation arises. We can choose to just see how things unfold and be chill about it. Um, another way 
is to be expansive in our approach or increasing. So we infuse a situation with positive energy that creates more possibilities for things to work out in a good way. And if that doesn't work, we can be compelling or magnetizing, right? If calming and enriching isn't working, then we might compel a resolution, draw on our own personal power to change the situation. And then if that fails, we need to be forceful or subjugating. We use it to end a situation in which conflict arises. An analogy would be if children are fighting over a toy and they won't, you know, listen to their mother, then you take the toy away and, you, and they're forced to find another way to play together. So I have a kind of an interesting conclusion. I had no conclusion. That was kind of the end. It was like three in the morning. I'm like, I'm done. And then a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. <laughs> uh, our um, practice object, Burton Day, made an appearance. And Patty Song took pictures, notified the police. He was here. He was at the cottage. But she did the right thing. She let him know, we see you. You're not welcome here. We will not hide and cower. I have your pictures. And I'm calling the cops. And he ran. And and we fall uh, she she, you know, informed the police and everything. And I'm happy to report that he's in custody. <clears throat> It's amazing. What a day. What a day. What a time. There are no accidents. <laughs> so this is difficult to practice. And while all of this was happening, my emotions were just at the surface. It was really intense. And I was short and impatient and highly emotionally charged with my friend. And I slammed the door. I left. I had to leave the room. We were disagreeing about something about this guy. And yeah. <laughs> just it's confession now. Um, and, and so it's like an interesting reminder, right? That our emotions sweep over us before we even know it. And, um, they can, they can, um, there are so many opportunities to practice his presence, the police. Uh, so um, there's a reminder to release, recognize the energy, stay present as situations evolve. And it is difficult practice. Um, yeah, but we're safe now at least until the next event happens, whatever that is, whatever happens, whatever life throws our way. So thank you for, thank you and good night. Oh, I'm supposed to ask if you have questions. <laughs> Please don't have any questions. I, I think I have sort of a comment discussion-y thing. Okay. So you mentioned versions, um, no, Bergen, oh. Bergen, uh, is corresponds and how that plays into protective practice. Bergen actually glosses Samaya as corresponds in English. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, a relationship with, you know, a very hungry dog. It's a learning relationship. It's a, a student teacher relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually much more than that, that you're willing to go in and you're willing to have this relationship that you know is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there are obligations on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's actually a, an interesting part of this whole practice that it it is about um, getting towards enlightenment. And sometimes that's uncomfortable. Thank you. Yeah, really good point. Thank you for sharing that.
Thanks, Jen. Um, the, I've been, I've had the experience of a, a few times of talking about wrathful deities. And I just wanted to just throw out there some of the stuff that I've heard around that. Go ahead. And um, one is that you have to be careful about the imagery because it's so powerful. If a person sees it that doesn't have any idea about symbolism or, you know, the, the backstory or the commitments involved, that it can turn them away from Buddhism generally with a bad taste in their mouth, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to be careful about that. That's one thing I was told. And there are actually some, there's at least one deity out there that has been cut off by the hierarchy, Buddhist hierarchy, because they found that no matter how many people went to learn from that deity or rely on that deity, that the results were negative. So, um, you know, I think it's it's a very powerful, it's powerful, the, um, the, uh, the deity, the wrathful deities. And then about fear, I was, there's something in, in a maybe more cultural, uh, it's, it's in the, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but it may be more cultural, is people also use Nechung oracle seeds for protection, and also uh, picturing a net of dorjis, around, black dorjis, surrounding you, and you, and depending on your capacity to imagine you can spread it you know you can cover the world with it even and it's a protective uh, imagery mm -hmm. and also something I just actually I was just recently before I knew you were doing this <laughs> this lecture I was like getting this little bit of a feeling like oh I feel like I need protections I mean usually I just like jump in the middle of things and I don't really think about that but it was sort of and I thought okay I'm just going to listen to this and I and I thought I'm going to use I'm just going to wear like a double dorji pendant just to, not because it has magic but because it reminds you of the Dharma which is the ultimate protection is you know practicing so and while I was doing that I found a dorji chain that reminded me of the surround you know the imagery and so like I said it's not magic but mm -hmm. it, it's a reminder of go back to the Dharma and the practice you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's my mm -hmm. wrathful. Oh, and I also heard from a teacher that there's the peaceful deities, there's the semi-wrathful deities, and then there's the wrathful deities. And that the practice of the the practices that go along with that, those those images, those characters, um appeal to different pe people of more like if you're more hard-headed, uh, a more violent image set of imagery may may cut through like you the word that you use kind of cut through the mundane mundane ha habitual behavior better where somebody else will be like faint it'll make them you know faint or whatever so they might want to go for the peaceful you know so i don't know those are just some things that i heard through the years about protection and and specifically about the raffle deities Thanks, protector okay. deities yeah that's mm -hmm. great and I like your point too about you know we we do take refuge in you know the jewel the three jewels, but we seem to need something more. We need muscle, and and it's a visualization, right? I mean, and it's it just kind of creates. I like that idea of it creates a context and a kind of a like to sort of allow us to begin to work with those difficult feelings because, and like you said. There is no magic. There isn't really something like happening external to us that's changing things. We're changing it from within, you know, which is why we're at the center and the guardians out here. But it just creates maybe like enough space or something to be able to begin to lean into it. Yes. You know. There's a couple of comments online, basically just saying thank you for the talk. So if anyone online has questions also, just uh, raise your hand. I could cover a huge uh, topic. You can't ever cover everything in a 40 minute talk or a 30 minute talk. But I wanted what this woman was talking about. Are you referring to the Shugden practice? Okay. There's a practice called Shugden. 
that the Dalai Lama has banned. And you can do a little more research on it, whole thing. And and uh, it created a big controversy within the Tibetan community. And they actually split up monasteries because a lot of the Tibetans won't give up the Shukin practice. But the Dalai Lama ended up because he even said it was ferocious. He had a hard time handling it. And so he asked his devotees not to not to follow the practice. It's an interesting story. Yeah. It, yes. Interesting. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Um, thanks, Jen. Like Mike said, it's like I'm totally in awe that you even, you know, tackled this subject. <laughs> it's just like, whoa. Um, but I was thinking, you know, the, 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 the four activities, sometimes when I'm feeling that I need protection in the form of encouragement or protection in the form of, um, you know, it's, it, that fear is like a, a, a really big emotion and covers a lot of things like you can be afraid of 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 you know Burton Day or you can be afraid of um uh, the loss of 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 a friend you can be afraid of you know something that's very near and dear and sweet you can be afraid of losing that mm -hmm. um and so sometimes um calling on deities other than I mean maybe this is what you were getting at other than the the wrathful protectors you know you can call also on or I have called on um medicine buddha in particular but also um chen resig um as as a protector mm -hmm. um a way of of helping a way of um taking away some of the shock, taking away some of the fear. Um, so I, in, I think in, in some way, maybe all of the deities can be a kind of protector deity mm -hmm. um, when we're not looking for wrathful, when we're looking mm -hmm. for pacification, when we're looking for increased. Um, anyway, so the, I don't always turn to Paul de Lama. I will frequently turn to other yeah. kinds of deities as well. Uh, that makes complete sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. If um, you know, I I think I think uh, depending on the level of terror that you're feeling, or fear, or anxiety, or whatever it is, you know, we 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 do have different sort of deities we can identify with, or identify we associate with different emotions maybe you know or different feelings um and a more pacifying one would be you know appropriate like you don't want to bring in i think i read an analogy you know if you're worried about somebody uh, you know threatening you physically and you were to choose a dog you're not going to choose the chihuahua over the mastiff Right. So, I mean, this sort of, and there's a kind of a silly analogy, but, you know, I mean, it's something or a golden retriever. I'll just keep with the bad analogy because I can't give it up. <laughs> but, you know, there, there would be, you know, more appropriate deity that you might turn to. Oh, something warming and loving and that, yeah, that, you know, was radiating light, but, but yeah. In fear, you might turn to some other. I think you make a really good point. Um, I was thinking about the when you were talking about the levels uh, that we can approach things in either a more passive or more aggressive, because different things require different um, um, response from ourselves. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I think it's very important that we develop from the beginning 
um, the calm center. And then if we need more um, aggressive behavior, we need to have already developed the calm center. So I think it's kind of a progressing where you, you do develop each of those abilities. And then if you need the stronger aggressive, you can be coming from the proper yeah, direction that's the thing. instead of just popping into that um, without the basis. Anyway, that's what I was thinking. Yes, I, good point. And it's that's part of keeping the view. You have to have the right view. There's kind of a growing, it's kind of a growing thing to make sure you start with the first and grow that. Yeah. And then you'll have the ability to uh, use the force that's necessary in the right way. <laughs> Wait, what is, what is, oh, is it the force? Um, so I, I, I just, uh, just very recently, um, Rinpoche was saying about people that do protector practice. He he said um, that they, you can often tell someone who's doing a lot of protector practice by their calmness and warmth mm -hmm. and um, peacefulness, actually, that they do a lot of protector practice that sometimes um, because of the word and also the visualizations that people imagine aggression because of the way that it looks. But someone, if you're in the presence of somebody who does a lot of practice like that, that they, uh, you you feel something di different than that coming from them. So I just thought that's important to say. And then also the last thing is that, and I'm not sure if this is the case because I am not a scholar, but I heard once or maybe more than once that the, the Dalai Lama, when, um, when he left Tibet, that there was the one tonka that he that he carried mm -hmm. was Paul and Lama. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. So that's that's the other thing. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. I I think that mm -hmm. that's it. Thank you. Okay, let me do closing prayers. Checking. Got a coach here. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rizik Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of an entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. So um, we have a few announcements. Um, but before I start, Jen, do you have any announcement you need to make? Yeah, I it's nice to see the back door without barricade. So um, uh, Rinpoche sent me a quick text that we're going to continue with MIB, uh, Men in Black, that's our security, um, just to ensure we, we don't know the outcome exactly of Burton yet, really. We know currently he's in custody, but we don't know the future. So we're just going to be conservative in that way. And he'll probably talk to the board about these things. I don't. I only have a very brief text, so I don't know more than that. And then um, 
next Saturday uh, is um, Mother's Day. And then after that is Garden Day. Garden Day is with Matthew, our friend Matthew's uh, leading it. And if you, um, uh, I think Matthew's still here, is he? Yes, there's Matthew. And if you want to have a party of pulling weeds, gloves will be provided, I believe. I'm going, actually, I just thought of that. I'm going to the dollar store. So, and if you bring donuts, then you're my friend. And then, um, let's see. And then uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pass this over to Connor because I've had sort of kind of a crazy morning. So I'm going to ask Connor to do the rest. Uh, Donna dudes is right after service, 1230-ish, I believe. Yeah. Okay. 1230. Um, so this coming week, uh, Geshe Dumpshu has been graciously uh, doing teachings on Thursday nights. This week and next week, he will not be teaching. On the 23rd of May, he's going to do Sojong, which is taking one-day precepts. So it's part of Sagadawa. Um, it, it's actually, you know, it help, helps increase your merit. You take one-day precepts that are more involved than just refuge precepts. Um, and it's sort of a fasting day. Uh, sort of the idea is that you keep your mind focused on Buddha and Dharma and right action, right livelihood, good ethics and everything. So that's at 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we'll do like a, a potluck breakfast or something. I think we're still sort of planning that. Um, and that'll be a great day. And then the 29th is Lung Rinpoche. Um, so he'll be coming in and doing teachings that evening, Wednesday. Please come. Uh, make sure you sign up online. Uh, it should be available in the roar. If you don't have the sign-up information, see Jen, Patty, me. It's also on the website. Okay, yeah. And then after that in June, uh, King Chur Losan Delik Rinpoche will be coming. He's actually one of Geshe Damsho and uh, Basan's teachers. So he's actually really special to them. So he'll be here for a few days. We still don't have a, a good plan for what's going on with that, but I'm going to tap some people to help uh, with that plan, including you. <laughs> um, and I think we have another announcement, but I'm done. Well, I just can't can't let you guys leave without telling you that there's Kirtan here on the third Saturday of every, we just started, it's brand new. So you can come and, and sing along uh, mantras and uh, Mike is over here. He's gonna, he leads us. So, uh, and then we have uh, another art at the end of the month. There's just too many things. You have to look at the roar or uh, actually better than the roar, to be honest, is more accurate is the calendar on the website, but those two things. Thank you. Thank you so much. And oh, um, this isn't in the roar yet because I just decided. Um, <laughs> um, after the garden party, so I'm gonna, we'll have the next meeting of service people. The next Dalek meeting will be on the 18th, um, 11:30 east, 12 o'clock, depending on what's going on with the garden party. So if you're part of that, stick around, and then um, maybe we can do some sort of a food thing. Yeah, so maybe we'll do some sort of a food thing. So the 18th, anyway, is going to be a lot going on Saturday. So yeah, yeah. I just noticed there's a bunch of delics here, so I wanted to say something. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, you guys are all here. All right, any other announcements? Announcements going once? Going twice. So oh, we've got another announcement. I'm going to start singing the announcement song pretty soon. Self-centered one. So at the um, Expressions event here at the end of the month, I'm going to have my work up. So if anybody wants to see, I'll, I'll be there. Pardon? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we got to cut this off so we get to keep uh, giving so oh, so many announcements. Thank you so much for your talk, Jen. Thank you all for coming. Uh, if you're here for the men's group, please stick around. Otherwise, I guess we can chat or whatever. Thanks. Oh,